Uh, hello, everybody, and um, good afternoon uh, uh, or good evening to people who are joining us from from other time zones. Uh, my name is Ben Horton, and I'm the project lead of Common Futures Conversations at Chatham House, uh, where I also head up our director's office. Um, great to have so many Common Futures Conversations members back with us, and thank. Thank you for um, joining us across the last two months um, of our work on youth and conflict. Um, and thank you also to people who are not members of the community, but who have joined us online today. We have an absolutely amazing panel um, and some great uh, speakers from our community who are also going to pitch their ideas. Um, and I'm going to stop talking um, to hand over to you, uh, to hand over now to our chair for the event, who is Common Futures Conversations member, Harry Smith. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Ben. And yeah, hello everyone and welcome to the call. Uh, this is a Common Futures Conversation webinar on policy ideas for youth in conflict. We've got some great guest speakers today with us and some fantastic policy proposals from our CFC members. Uh, before we begin our interactive discussion, uh, I'm going to quickly introduce you the concept of Common Futures Conversations, if you aren't already familiar with it. So Common Futures is a flagship Chatham House program centred in on bringing together young people from across Africa and Europe for discussions on important topics to devise solutions. This event is the culmination of a six week long discussion on how young people are impacted by conflict. Today, three CFC members will outline their policy solutions for our panellists, and they'll provide feedback and discussion for the ideas put forward. With that, I'd like to um, issue a warm welcome to our entire audience. Uh, our audience, as Ben said, is made up of Common Futures members, Chatham House members, and all other participants who are joining us through Zoom today. It's great to have you all in attendance. As I said, my name is Harry, and I'm a Common Futures member. I'm also a fourth year student at the University of Kent, and I'm studying history and politics and data analytics. Our first speaker today is Alison Griffin. She's currently working as Head of Influencing on Conflict and Humanitarian Issues at Save the Children UK. She leads a team of, of, of policymakers that galvanise the public to take action to uphold norms and practices on human rights and humanitarian law. From advocating for UN Security Council resolutions to power building alongside diaspora communities, previously she's led external affairs at Refugee Action, a UK-based organisation, and before spent time working on local advocacy projects in West Africa with Action Aid Senegal. Our second speaker is Dr Knox Chitio. He's an associate fellow with the Africa programme at Chatham House. He's also the president of the Britain Zimbabwe Society. Prior to joining Chatham House, Knox was a Nelson Mandela Africa fellow and head of the Africa programme at the Royal United Services Institute. Before coming to the UK, Knox was a senior lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe and also a deputy director at the Center for Defense Studies. Knox has also worked with South African Development Community and African Union on security and development initiatives. Knox has widely published on Zimbabwean, Southern African and wider African security and development issues. He's the former chair and current board member of the Business Council for Africa and other organizations. Knox received the Ben TV Sky News Diplomacy Award in 2010. He's also the recipient of the 2021 Zimbabwe Achievers Award. I don't believe our final speaker is with us yet. Um, shall I go ahead and introduce her anyway? Um, Harry, we're just confirming whether or not she can still make it. Um, so why don't we crack on and we can introduce her as when she joins. Okay, great. So a, a bit of quick, quick housekeeping before I um, give the floor to our panellists. This meeting is on the record and is being recorded. All participants uh, will be muted during the presentation, but I'll ask you that if you have a question to click the Q&A function at the bottom right hand uh, corner of your screen, and I'll try to read out some of the questions a little later on um, after our CFC members present their work. I'll give our guest speakers five minutes to present their initial remarks, and five minutes for our CFC members to present their ideas. And with that, uh, I'd like to give the floor to our first guest speaker, Alison Griffin. Alison, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Harry, and it's great to be here, everyone. So I work for Save the Children UK. I'm going to talk about children in conflict. 
Um, and whilst armed conflicts and crises affect people of all ages, children and young people are particularly susceptible to the effects of war. Across our planet, approximately 449 million children, that is one child in every six, live in a conflict zone. One in every six. In 2021, 230 million children lived in high intensity conflict zones, which means that war is all around them. And that number was a 9% increase on the previous year. Of course, these young people dream of a peaceful tomorrow, to live somewhere that's safe, away from bullets and bombs that are killing and maiming them. And there are three main reasons we believe more children are being harmed in conflict than ever before. Firstly, Conflict is happening not in battlefields, but in our cities where children live. War in narrow civilian streets with massively powerful explosive weapons is having a horrific impact on children. Blasts break bodies, they damage developing minds, they shut down schools, they shut down hospitals, they stop aid convoys getting in. Save the Children see this every day in our work with children. In Yemen, we've seen the eight years of war there, a child is killed or injured by explosive every two days after eight years of war. In fact, last week, Save the Children launched the, wor the world's first centre for paediatric blast injury studies at Imperial College in London. This centre will carry out research into the impact of conflict trauma on children and develop technology to address the challenges faced for those with blast trauma injuries. The second reason why more children are being harmed in conflicts is that it lasts longer. And over time, the brutality rises whilst the social and the economic order fails. So in these conditions, it's always children who suffer the most. From Afghanistan to the DRC to South Sudan, protracted crises are creating an endemic protection crisis for children and all of the mental health implications that come with that. One of the programmes that Save the Children runs is animal therapy. And I've heard from staff about therapy dogs, where the, it's the only thing sometimes that will help a traumatised child be able to open up again, to ground that child in the present moment, and perhaps start the process of letting go of some of the fear and anxiety that they've been carrying for years in some cases. And the third reason why more children are being harmed in conflict than ever before is because conflict thrives on a crisis of compliance. So we've seen, particularly since um, last year, global power relations frayed, fractured. Member states in the UN Security Council are failing in their mandate to protect conflict, to protect children in conflict. Um, in Ukraine, more than four children a day are killed or injured. And we imagine that this number is actually grossly underestimated. There's reports of sexual violence, killing, torture, other degrading treatment of children, which are continuing to emerge in the Ukraine context, with very little regard to international humanitarian law and international human rights law. In terms of solutions to this, the UK government and other member states have really important roles to play in the protection of children in conflict. The UK particularly has a seat at some of the most powerful tables on the planet. Um, like other various member states, they hold positions at the UN, on the Security Council, on the Human Rights Council, in organisations like NATO, the G7, the G20 and the Commonwealth. And the UK also has strong diplomatic ties to governments and militaries around the world. Um, we train 11,000 peacekeepers a year, for example. Also, the UK was crucial to the creation of the United Nations and drafting various declarations, declarations of human rights, the Refugee Convention, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and UK leadership has helped secure the passage of the Arms Trade Treaty. So when used responsibly, UK leadership and other member state leadership has time and time again saved lives. But every time we fail to protect a child, a small tear in that fabric of law, the precept and the principle that holds together our collective security is, is evident. So every child's future we see destroyed creates a risk to the future security of a whole society. And what we're seeing today is millions of futures being destroyed and millions of children at risk of the physical, emotional, psychological and social harm in conflict. And of course, this is a crisis of today, but it's also one of tomorrow because children will, young people will inevitably become the next adults, generation of adults. 
So governments, donors and parties to conflict can and they must tackle the problem. And that's why it's really, really great to be here today to hear from young people about interesting creative policy proposals that support the needs of fellow young people in conflict situations. I look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you, Alison, for those very profound words. Um, if I could now pass over to Knox for his remarks. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Um, and very interesting to hear Alison's thoughts on this as well. Um, hi there, everyone. Um, what I thought I'd do, I'll um, look at kind of three things uh, that we were asked to look at as well as how young people come up in your work, uh, what you see as the biggest challenge, and again, what are the potential solutions? Um, so just to say from the start, my, my take is as a person who has been in conflict uh, myself, in terms of where do young people come up in my, in my work. So I myself, uh, I'm a Zimbabwean um, and I'm from an older generation. We came, I came up in the liberation struggle um, era, the 1960s and 70s. Um, so we were directly involved in, in, the, in the conflict as young people then. Post, um, post 1980 um, in, the, in the region and in Zimbabwe, um, we brought together the younger generation with the military through education uh, in, a, in, a, in what was then a sort of brand new innovative policy of um, teaching um, war studies, development and security um, at universities in Zimbabwe. It's a model which was, has been replicated in the region um, since then. Um, coming towards the more present era, um, I've worked with organizations like uh, Minds Advisory Group um, and other organizations in SADC and the African Union as well uh, in areas such as the Sudan, South Sudan, um, DR Congo and with the, the African um, diaspora. So we hear a lot of youth voices um, in that context. Some of the biggest thing, uh, things that I see over and over again, some of the biggest challenges um, I would say is um, I think with regards to armed conflict in particular, um, I think one of the biggest challenges is the normalization of violence, um, particularly in armed co conflict, but also in times of political conflict. Um, violence normalizes, it becomes the default setting. And getting over that, um, it's, a, it's a massive, massive um, issue because what happens is that the psychology um, the minds also become militarized. And sometimes even after a conflict is over, people are still psychologically militarized. So I think um, demilitarizing the mind, um, I think is, a, is, is, is absolutely crucial. And it's a massive, massive challenge in, in areas of conflict and also in areas of, of political contestation. But I think that's one of the, the, the big challenge. The other is, um, pervasive instability and insecurity, particularly in areas of armed conflict. Um, that sense of chronic um, short-termism, you actually don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. And this causes, I think, enormous stresses and trauma, particularly on young people who want to be thinking of a future. They don't know if they've got a future or not. And I've seen this over and over again. This is one of the biggest challenges is thinking of a tomorrow, uh, as, I, as I call it, because everything in armed conflict situation tends to be geared towards, can I get through today? And I see this over and over again. So trying to help and listen to young people and trying to get them to engage with, with a tomorrow and thinking of tomorrow is a massive, massive challenge. Of course, it, it can also be the situation that people are um, Inter internal or and or external displacement also becomes uh, an issue um, or forced, forced migration that can become an, an issue as well. Um, I think another challenge is um, an alternative to having your gun or your weapon, um, your physical weapon as your best friend. How do we get beyond that, seeing that there are other alternatives to look, the weaponization um, and again, this, this is, is a, a massive, massive challenge. One thing that I've um, seen over and over again is issues around, and I think Alison alluded to this, um, unexploded ordnance 
in armed conflict areas and post armed conflict landmines, shells, um, and so on and so forth. I've seen this in, in various areas. Um, how to get um, people to feel secure because, of course, it affects lives and livelihoods. So, working with organizations and young people um, to get that sense of, of security, creating safe zones, safe lanes, the um, things like demining and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's gone a little bit down the global agenda. I think we need to bring it back up to the global agenda because unexploded ordnance um, globally is a huge, huge issue. And there were, you know, we had, there have been coalitions of a landmine free 2025 and so on and so forth, which hasn't um, happened as, as well as was expected. So I think for me, that is one of the, the, the big um, issues. In terms of, um, sorry, in, in terms of potential solutions, I think that the, the main thing at, at different levels, one is to get the youth voice and youth agency in the security sector discourse globally, to mainstream the youth voice in those security sector um, discourses. We've seen it at some levels um, in more development um, discourse, but I have to say, I, I would like to see much more of, this, uh, of the youth voice in conversations, say, between security sector, policymakers, um, civil society. Everyone tends to be in their own lane, particularly um, the youth voice. And I think one of the key things we need to do is to bring the youth voice to the table in security sector discourses. I think that is absolutely crucial. To me, it's kind of the missing voice. Another solution, sorry, not a, not a solution, but something perhaps to think about is youth, is this intergenerational conversations, particularly around youth and re, uh, religious leaders and youth and traditional leaders, um, not just in Africa, but, but globally, because, and particularly in, in Africa and Global South, traditional leaders play a very important role in armed conflict and in peacemaking and peace building. And having those conversations between the youth generation um, and um, youth, uh, uh, sorry, and re religious leaders, traditional leaders, I think is 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 very in, important. Um, there are other things that I, I could uh, mention, but perhaps in the interest of of time, um, what I would say is in conflict situations, the the, the first casualty, um, in particularly in post conflict situations, is the plan. Everyone has got a plan in in post conflict situations of peace building and so on and so forth. But you find the plan, when it hits reality, you have to be adaptive and adaptable to hear the, the, the youth voice. So I think flexibility and creativity, sport, creative arts, I've found um, getting the youth to express themselves sometimes in conflict zone or peace building zone by drawing, uh, by playing sports, things like that. These are things that people don't often think about, but I found in some cases it can actually be be, um, be quite useful. So I think we have to be quite open and flexible um, in, in our minds and listen um, to the youth because the youth, I think, have an important uh, role to play. I think I'll leave it at that and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your remarks, Knox. Uh, that was very profound. And the, the aspect of, of, of psycho, uh, psychology on children and the effect of violence on their, on their mental uh, health was something I've never heard of, about before. So thank you for that. Um, our final speaker is with us. So I will um, give her introduction before she can speak. Um, that is Chido Cleopatra and Pemba. She's the youngest diplomat in the African Union chair, um, chairperson's cabinet. She leads on youth affairs with the responsibility to front the voices of over 870 million youth in the 55 countries and governments in Africa as the African Union Special Envoy on Youth. She's been recognized on the list of 100 most influential African women and the CNN New York as top 100 under 40 most influential people in, of African descent. As a public policy expert, she has worked with various institutions to coordinate activities focused on social equity and, pol and policy advocacy, including on education, climate change, public health, whilst promoting the continental framework on youth, peace and security in Africa. She's an alumni of the Emerging Security Sector Leaders Programme from the uh, Africa Centre for Strategic Studies, 
National Defense University, US Department of Defense. She is a Global Leadership Council member of the Generation Unlimited. The floor is yours, Chida. Thank you very much. Um, my apologies, I'm actually having challenges with my camera, so I'm not sure if you can see me, from, but from my end, this showing an error. I would have loved to have my, my video on, but I guess I'm gonna to have to speak in audio. But first of all, thank you for this opportunity for me to be able to contribute to this pertinent discussion that's happening today. And, you know, as I speak on this pressing issue that affects the youth in Africa and in Europe, I think, you know, we really need to dwell on, um, you know, conflict in terms of the scourge that threatens the stability and development of our societies, as well as this impact on young people that cannot be overstated. Uh, when you look at conflict, I think it has been persistent, a persistent challenge, not just only in Africa for decades, you know, leading to widespread uh, displacement, also leading to poverty and political instability. And I believe that young people are often the most affected by these conflicts as they are forced to bear the brunt of the violence as well as the destruction. And many are forced to flee their homes and become refugees, also facing uncertain futures and limited opportunities for education, employment, and personal growth. This not only robs them of their fundamental human rights, but also undermines their potential as future leaders and contributors to their communities. And when we, when we really look at the root cause in terms of you know, issues to do with conflict, we often see that you know, looking and talking to young people, especially in my experience currently as the African Union Youth Envoy, having embarked on the listening tour across Africa and in the diaspora, you find that um, the major issue that comes out of this is lack of opportunities for young people leading to high unemployment rates. And as a result of this, we find that a lot of young people are influenced in terms of joining um, violent um, extremism groups and, and the likes. And in addition to that, you find that um, most of this violence is also as a result of, you know, when you look at the lack of opportunities from the perspective of high unemployment, there's also another side that looks at like democratic governance, where young people feel frustrated because they're not really involved in terms of the political space, political participation, as well as, you know, being able to fully contribute within the perspective of their governments. So we see a lot of rise in that. But if we look on the contrary, um, you know, uh, in terms of Europe, we've also seen this rise in conflicts, conflicts but are often, that are often fueled by you know, ethnic, religious, and political tensions in the past, and currently experiencing one that is at the adver adverse stages. I think this has led to a surge in the violence and extremism, extre extremism uh, creating a sense of fear and security among young people. And in addition to this, conflicts in neighboring regions have also had a ripple effect on, uh, you know, looking from the perspectives of European youth, with many being drawn into the conflict as foreign fighters or refugees. Again, we look at the social and psychological impact of these conflicts on young people, which cannot be overstated, with many facing trauma, depression, and anxiety as a result, already cumulative to the existing challenges that we're faced with, with high unemployment, as well as you know, lack of young people being involved in the democratic governance. It is clear that conflict presents significant challenges to young people, both in Africa and in Europe. However, I believe that we must not lose hope as young people, and specifically, you know, always having our voice heard and working collectively to ensure that we make um, a huge impact across the continent and globally too. And uh, within my role, including at the African Union, you know, very committed to working towards a more peaceful and stable Africa with the young people in the forefront to ensure that we bring our voice together in that regard. And, you know, as we move forward, I believe that we must prioritize the needs of young people ensuring that they have access to education, to employment and other opportunities that will enable them to become active participants in the social, economic and political life of their countries, as well as ensure that we build their capacities to truly get involved uh, on the political space and have more young people taking positions on the political forefront too is, is very important. But really zoning in on the root cause of the conflict is very important that we realize where the root cause is coming from and be able to address it from there, working collectively 
with you know with with the public sector with the private sector and young people as well in the forefront so i believe that we must also look at investing in programs that promote this reconciliation that promote this tolerance and understanding while also empowering young people to become agents of change and advocates for peace and just in closing i'd just like to say let us remember that the future of our continent and our world depends really on the contributions of our young people and it's important that we must work together to ensure that they're not held back by conflict, but are given the tools they need to build a brighter and more peaceful future for all. And, you know, I think that's what I'll just say in summary, but really looking forward, um, you know, to just get to hear more of the contributions in this discussion as we um, continue on it. Thank you, and I'll hand over back to you. Thank you, Tudor, for your comments. Uh, I think that you really put an emphasis on why we need to give uh, children opportunities in a political space, but in other spaces as well, so that we can mitigate the influence of, of conflict on them. Um, thank you to all our speakers for your really insightful remarks. I'm now going to invite our three Common Futures Conversations community members to present their policy ideas. Uh, our first presenter is uh, Victoria Portnaya from Ukraine. Victoria's ideas seek to create incentives for refugees to return to their home countries. This is important to the rebuilding process and the need for human capital in the aftermath of war. She'll be looking at a package of incentives that can address the specific needs of young people. For example, the psychological, financial and legal challenges that prevent young people from returning to their home country. Victoria, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the idea and to express uh, the problem that we struggle with. Um, and actually, refugee crisis and military conflicts as a reason for it uh, provokes a significant decrease in uh, amount of human capital in the affected uh, country. Uh, in the country that was affected by the war uh, or any other type of uh, significant uh, military um, viol uh, violence. Uh, and after war, in the post-war period, uh, this decrease in human capital leads uh, to decrease in country's capabilities uh, to rebuild uh, its economy, its society, and its political infrastructure, its democracy, for example. Uh, and Mm, yeah, uh, and moreover, if young people are concerned uh, when they are refugees in some host countries, uh, they have more opportunities, more possibilities uh, to prolong uh, their staying there for a permanent uh, time. For example, they can marry citizens of their host countries, or they can find a good educational or job opportunities and therefore have more uh, incentives uh, to stay uh, there permanently. And they have, uh, they will have some legal grounds uh, to do it. So therefore we have to create some uh, stimuli for young people and for other age categories uh, to return to their home countries uh, after war ends, uh, because it's very important for rebuilding their societies and their motherlands uh, to recover from the war. And for this, I propose uh, a couple of uh, dimensions of policies. And the first one is concerned uh, with psychological support. Uh, to former refugees, because for many of them, it's very important uh, to stay in psychological sense of security, as Dr. Knox told, because for many of them, it's, uh, it's a thing that makes them reluctant to return back to their home because there they can feel insecure even uh, as the war ends. And therefore, we have to firstly uh, recover them from their trauma, from their psychological trauma. And for this, for example, some kind of 
mandatory psychological observation and psychological control is needed. Uh, and more uh, medical expenses, if they are needed, uh, for example, anti-depression uh, medication should be recovered by some external funds because um, a majority of former refugees are in a very bad uh, financial situation as well, but um, such psychological medication is usually very expensive. Uh, moreover, some kind of job support is also needed. Uh, for example, before returning, uh, refugees can be provided uh, with some job search assistance in their motherland. Uh, and also they can be provided uh, with some help of writing CV, resume, uh, and finding uh, some job vacancies. Or for example, they also can be supported with some free uh, resources uh, to gain some new skills and maybe a new profession. Uh, moreover, we should uh, stimulate companies uh, to open their offices in um, post-war countries if um, many of the workers were refugees from there because it will not only uh, help uh, their motherlands to recover from their in economic terms, but it will also help them to maintain their former jobs uh, without um, necessity to stay in their host country. Um, and also maybe we should create some um, reputation stimuli uh, and some substitutes to uh, reopen or open new offices of many companies in post-war countries because it's uh, also important for economic recovery and for um, creating more opportunities for former refugees uh, to gain some jobs there. Uh, also, we should think about financial assistance uh, for those who need it, uh, and especially for senior people, uh, for senior citizens, uh, or for example, for disabled people, because uh, they have uh, almost no possibilities to find a job. Uh, and, but at the same time, they need some financial assistance. Uh, to survive uh, in the post-war period in their home country. Uh, also, education support is needed because during the war, a lot of kids, they are deprived uh, of uh, education, uh, of national education from their home country. And therefore, for their parents, it's very stressful uh, to um, come back home because they understand that it will create extra um, psychological stress, extra psychological pressure for their children. Um, and yeah, and for example, for this, before returning, kids should be tested by national examination, and then depending on their results, they can be assisted um, in some educational support uh, to make up for educational gap. Uh, and financial uh, resources are limited, but we can uh, use, for example, national budget of the home country. Uh, we can use some contribution from host countries, and of course, uh, funds from United Nation, uh, from United Nation, Nation, uh, and from various uh, thematic uh, national government organizations uh, to help with this assistance. Thank you for your attention and for the opportunity. Thank you, Victoria. Um, if I could now uh, invite our panelists to um, uh, reflect on Victoria's presentation with some brief remarks. If we could, yeah, if we could keep it brief so we can keep the, the uh, uh, go on to the next um, policy proposal. Thank you. I'll go first if unless anyone else wants to. Um, thank you, Victoria. That was really, really interesting. I, I particularly liked um, the idea you had around opening uh, programs for refugees who are returning home with 
um, who are able to run those programs themselves because of course people who have lived experience of the issues are much better to respond to them that's really interesting um I think as well donor countries particularly around the mental health and psychosocial support provision I think donor countries are really switching on to this in contexts like Iraq we're hearing words like mental health crisis across the country being used um, and donors thinking about what funding they need to provide so there's potentially opportunity with that. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps say a few words. Um, thank you so much, Victoria, really, really. I, I agree uh, pretty, with pretty much everything um, you said. And uh, as with others, I, I, um, I'm really um, interested in, in your thought ideas on psychological support. Um, as I think we mentioned um, back in my home country and other um, countries, it is absolutely vital. Um, and I think overall, um, it's very important to, um, to see this as a process um, from war to post-war, from being in uh, another country to returning home. It is a process which has various components and um, various uh, legs. So psychological support is so important. It's the transition. And I, I especially liked your point about perhaps older people who have been um, forced to, to leave home and are now coming back and their problems often um, in finding employment and so on and the support they need as well as the younger people because often older people may feel there's nothing for me uh, to go back to um, and I, I have no, there's, there's no job, the jobs are for other people. So it's so important again to have um, that support across the board, intergenerational support I would say, but thank you so much. And Tito, if you had any comments on Victoria's presentation? Thank you um, very much, Harry. I share the same um, sentiments as um, my, um, the former speaker, Mr. Chitio, in terms of how, um, you know, this is also interrelates to, um, you know, mental health as well as the effects on young people from a psychological point of view. I will not add more to it um, based on what's already been said, but just to say I share the same sentiments and um, really good um, insights as well as recommendations coming. Thank you everyone for your reflections and uh, remarks. Uh, our second um, presenter is uh, Ian Wangoto from the UK. Um, Ian is proposing a scheme to provide young people in conflict affected areas with sports equipment. This serves to develop community skills and a healthy pastime for young people in order to create alternatives to lives defined by conflict and organised crime. Ian, the floor is all yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Conflict is most often the result of differences in political positions, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, religious belief, and access to material resources. And these are all factors which do not account for who can participate in sports. The nature of playing sports, which brings people together with only a want to participate as prerequisite, is an opportunity where different people may be brought together to enjoy their common interests, where the racket is your best friend and not a rifle breaking down barriers and revealing each other's humanity, which may prevent future conflict. Sport develops the values that we need to tackle violence properly. Courage, equality and respect are the curriculum of sport, which allow for character and community building, and is already being used by youth crime prevention strategies in the United Nations and the British government. Sports is low in financial cost, but high in cultural value, which is why our approach in sport should focus on sustainability. And by that, I mean asking how we can maintain the access of sports to conflict impacted areas where people have an opportunity to develop their skills with the creation and maintenance of sports facilities. Since its creation in 2005, NBA Cares, a sports focused charity founded by the NBA, has engaged more than 60 million children in youth basketball programs globally. Former NBA players such as Dikembe Mutombo and current players such as Stephen Curry have developed basketball courts for, ast for aspiring players globally. These initiatives provide the tools and education necessary 
on how to maintain these sports centres once NGOs leave, later returning sports centres to local control. Adapting this approach of charitable intervention to conflict areas, where local sports projects are developed by sporting bodies and charities, with the intention of handing over control to locals, may provide a space of stability for people in situations that are inherently unstable. The values one receives from playing sports may be enhanced further through allowing young people management control over their sports entirely. Tasking young people with the maintenance of local sports properties may incentivize entrepreneurship, delivering the lessons of creativity to its users. Empowering young people by creating an air of their own control and for their own enjoyment fosters the feelings of consistency and community that are always lacking in conflict. A one size fits all approach doesn't work with my proposal. And I think that is a very good thing because it allows sports to be adaptable where necessary, still maintaining its core values. And this is where education works best. As a mentor for DebateMate, our organization works to build the confidence, teamwork and communication skills of school children nationally through their future, through debating. And this is an active exercise. We're out of our seats. We're moving, talking, speaking together in teams. And this is the power of learning through doing, moving on the go, making sure that we can learn actively with a promise that we can maintain our skills for the future. This is how we can ensure that our children as a future not only have lessons, which do not have to take place necessarily inside a classroom, but an opportunity where they can learn through fun activities, ones that stimulate their mind, their brain, uh, and, and, and many other parts of their body and their community as well. Sports is fundamentally a language to me. After qualifying for the 2006 World Cup, Ivorian striker Didier Drogba suggested that we want to have fun, so stop firing your guns. He said this because the Ivory Coast was in a civil war, and it's hoped that football success could unite the nation succeeded. In the goodness of time, moved by the fanfare led by Didier Drogba, warring groups met at the negotiation table and soon after arranged a ceasefire. Drogba was no diplomat. He was just a football player, but he spoke to people through the language of sports, which allowed citizens to realize their common humanity. And through this communication, the communication of sport, perhaps we around other parts of the world may have an opportunity to realize our own common humanity with others. And through that, we can begin conversations on how we can soon after begin to end war and establish long lasting peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for your presentation. Um, if I could first invite uh, Knox to speak, then Chido, and then uh, Alison, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'll keep it um, very brief. Um, I completely agree. I think it's a great idea. And, and uh, as I say, it, it's, it's also been shown in other parts of Africa. I well remember um, to my experiences in the DR Congo. Um, sport helps to unify. And I think the other thing about sport, and here in Congo, it was football as well, plus also culture and the arts. And the good thing about it, I think, is that it is sustainable. Because what is, it, what is very, very important is to make these processes sustainable, simple, and durable. And I think sport is a wonderful unifier and also it's a symbol of the future. So I completely agree. I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. And Chido, if you'd like to give your remarks, please. Thank you. Uh, I really liked uh, when you mentioned about not all, not all size fits all, like not one size fits all. And I think that's very important because when we're looking at solutions, we really need to zone in specifically on, you know, how conflict affects different countries, as well as, you know, again, looking at the root cause and how you can address this. I love the idea of using sports because I think it's something that's very innovative and when you look at it from a perspective of young people, or just generally everyone, you know, sports and entertainment, I would say, uh, you know, are some of the common um, ways of interest that can bring people together uh, beyond and besides their, you know, different perspectives on, you know, on, 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 on various issues. So that's my input. And also, pardon me for previously, I didn't mention Mr. Chitio. Pardon me, I meant to say Dr. Anox Chitio. Thank you.
Thanks, Ian. That was great. And um, nothing really to add to other than what the fellow panellists have already said, but um, I really liked the word you used around young people gaining confidence in the team sport. Um, I think that's so important for mental health and development and all of the things that you outlined really well. Um, and so the Children has a partnership with Arsenal, actually, where we do coaching for life schemes in refugee camps, one, one in Jordan, others in the Philippines. Um, and also I was thinking perhaps there's some scope for thinking through how that might manifest with the Olympics, I think, next year. Um, so, yeah, but really, really great um, proposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again to our panellists for your for your comments. Um, unfortunately, our third uh, Common Futures community member couldn't uh, be here to present her policy, but what we'll do is we'll circulate her idea around after the um, the event, and I'll, and I'll just detail um, what, her, what her policy was about. This is um, Esther Tennis from Malawi. Um, Esther's idea looked at involving uh, current and former members of the armed services to provide conflict education to young people especially in areas uh, currently experiencing peace, but facing longer term instability or vulnerabilities to conflict. So uh, we'll get that out to the audience um, after, after this is concluded. Uh, so thank you for everyone for presenting your fantastic policy solutions and to our guest speakers for your insightful remarks about these solutions. Now I'd like to round off the webinar by taking some questions from the audience. Uh, through the Q&A feature. I can see we've already got some questions, so I will be asking them now. Um, so the first question is for you, Alison, um, and it says, youth, uh, youth feeling conflict um, can be a great risk of human trafficking in the host countries, especially when there are no regular and safe routes to enter the host country. How do you see the recent UK proposals to change modern slavery laws to deter immigrants? Will it help keeping vulnerable youth safe or increase irregular migration methods? Yes, thank you. Very timely um, question. Um, no, we don't believe it will deter immigrants. Um, and we are, say the children, is at odds with the government on this. Say the children in the sector in the UK. Um, we don't believe there's a pull factor for asylum seekers to be pulled to the UK. We believe they're pushed to flee their homes. So no, this proposed policy, we don't think will help keep, keep people safe. Um, and also from our perspective, it seems to be less about policy and more about politics in the UK at the moment. I mean, we're, the fact that we can't build a political consensus on not detaining children is a hugely sad indictment of what's happened in British politics currently. Um, yeah we are lobbying on it. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Knox um, from Mahin. One of the factors uh, prevalent in youth related conflicts is radicalization of youth people by terrorist elements or military elites to advance their power ambitions who impart extremist discourse and religious intolerance and result in widespread violence and interfaith hostility. How can we counter this radicalization, particularly in cultural, culturally and religiously homogeneous societies where minorities are otherized? If just education was the answer, why do they fall prey to the radical discourses in the first place? Could other factors like socioeconomic ones explain this vulnerability to radicalization? Excellent question. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, and it's a quite a, a huge question. I think um, some of it, uh, there's various parts to it. I think part of it is the question of what causes people to go to conflict, and some of that is with regards to the socio-economic situation within the country. Um, those are some of the four factors um, towards radicalization. I think a second issue is um, social media. Um, how we handle social media, um, both amongst the youth and intergenerationally, I think is a very, very um, important factor. The other thing perhaps I would mention, um, not just in the modern age, but in during my time as well, which may sound odd, is issues around the 
so-called sort of glamorization of violence, um, violence or armed conflict as an adventure. Um, we had this sort of during our time, I've seen it also in, in the modern age where younger um, minds are, are, are given the impression that war is an adventure, you know, come, comes to war, is it, you know, and, and given this sort of false glamorization um, of, of war. And I think if we can address that issue and the people behind it, the factors behind it, this false glamorization, um, then I think that may be one of, of the solutions. But ultimately, I think the issue is with regards to addressing the root causes um, of conflict in countries and between countries. Um, could we uh, could we open that question to the rest of the panel? Uh, Chido, do you have anything to say on that question? Nothing to add from my from my end at this moment. Well, Alison, yourself, anything to anything to add to that question? I think Dr. Knox did a great job. Okay. Um, uh, this is a question for the entire panel again. Um, this is by uh, from Dina. And her question is, in the book Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men, Caroline Perez mentioned that humans are six times more deadly to their own species than the average mammal. But it's not humans that are deadly. The UN found that 96% of homicides are perpetrated by men. Would there be less conflict if women were the policymakers? Alison, would you like to answer that question or any of the panelists? <laughs> what a great question. Um, I mean, my stance is we should try and make make women the policymakers than we'd see. Um, I am all about women's equality and the fight for feminism. So, yeah, I, I, I don't have any data to hand, but let's let's make the world do that and let's see. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would um, agree with, with Alison in, in that point. I, again, I, I don't have data, but I think, yes, um, women should be brought more into the policy space, into the political space. And again, in that security sector discourse, we need to have not just the young, but more women in that security sector, security sector space overall. I think it is absolutely vital. And hopefully that would help to, um, to, to you know to to reduce the levels of of, of conflict so uh, I think it comes back to what I said in the beginning we need to have young people more young people and more um, women in the security sector space overall thank you and Chido, would you have anything to say on this question? Okay, same from my end. I do not have the stats at, at hand, but um, again, looking at the root cause, I think we need to establish why this is sore. But when you look at it from the perspectives of, of, of perspective of women, um, I think again, because women have previously been disadvantaged and have not had the same um, type of opportunities as men. And as a result of this, we do need more um, women getting into policy making. And not only that, but also looking at the value that they bring to the table as, um, you know, key players towards um, uh, peace building. And again, looking at, um, uh, you know, best practices, I guess, when we have, um, you know, women in in, in, in policy making women in, 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 in positions of power and women in positions of you know um, getting involved in peace building where that has been successful and I think that would make a case to have more women being involved um, you know to be able to contribute towards um, policy making and peace building. Thank you Chido. Um, I have a question uh, from Victoria for uh, Dr. Knox. She says, uh, I can totally re relate to your comment about mental health problems of young people who want to think about the future but cannot because of war. As tomorrow, they might not be alive. You already mentioned some solutions like drawing classes. 
But do you think there is anything else civil society and policymakers can do to help these children and teenagers, especially through education policies different to those implemented during peaceful times? And are there good examples of solutions implemented on a national level? I, I, I will ask Knox first, but if anyone else would like to answer that question, then please feel free. Um, thank you. Um, I, I think edu education um, is one of the key um, elements in, with regard to this Partic participatory um, education, not top down education, but participatory education at, at horizontal level, bring um, the youth voices into issues around education, into issues around mental health and acknowledging. And this sometimes can be a cultural issue um, because sometimes, you know, and especially for myself as an older generation, it was not the norm to speak of issues like depression, mental health issues. So just acknowledging that these things exist, I think is, a, is an important starting point in some areas to actually addressing the issues because still today, even in now in some areas, simply to acknowledge that there are issues around depression and mental health is, is still not, not kind of a sta standard practice. So acknowledging that there are these issues and then finding ways um, of, of addressing them, um, either th you know, through education, through, through workshops, through familial support as well. If, if the family is still whole and the, the family and societal um, support can be there, I think that is, is important. Societal support sometimes can be a, a very, very useful um, way of addressing um, these issues. But I'll also invite my fellow panelists. Uh, I think I'm sure you may have um, other ideas as well. But I think those are some of the things I'll, I'll mention. Um, Alison, I have a question for you then. Um, uh, this is from an anonymous uh, user. They say, my general note is that we call this youth in conflict, but most of the time we talk about kids and there's a significant difference. What about youth who unfortunately become mobilised or have PTSD after the conflict? Is anyone taking care of them? Thanks. Yeah. And that's a really, really good flag. Um, and of course, there is a distinction. And when, um, say, the children talk in, in broad terms, we're talking about anybody under 18. Of course, it's not just you, young people, youth and kids. It's infants, babies, all of whom have different needs as they as they grow up. Um, young people who've been mobilised, um, recruited into armed groups, um, have a very specific set of needs and say so the children does some programming to support those in places like South Sudan and lots of community groups on the ground across the region um, doing amazing work as well to make sure that um, young people can start to deal with that trauma. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Chido, I have a question here from uh, Demi. She says, thank you so much for these insightful ideas. How could youth living outside of conflict zones contribute best to aid youth in conflict? What are possible practical actions youth as a whole can take to ensure stability and work to help these living in conflict zones? Okay, I think first of all, participation is very key. Participation. And secondly, creating the platforms and ensuring that information is available for platforms where young people can meaningfully contribute and make it practical. I'll give a specific example of the African Union and one of the initiatives we have going on under our Youth Peace and Security Program. And under this program, we actually have appointed Youth Peace Ambassadors. And these Youth Peace Ambassadors work in um, across the regions, the five regions across Africa. And part of their work is to advocate and to, to, to lobby policy in terms of the implementation of national action plans of peace, um, youth peace and security. And in this regard, already that's a platform that's being created, but we try to bring more awareness of, of, you know, of, of these um, um, specific initiatives that are also open to young people outside of Africa and in 
the diaspora to be able to contribute. Now, on a larger platform, just um, last year, we had our first Youth Peace and Security Continental Dialogue, which was held in Bujumburi in Burundi. And part of it as well is uh, lobbying, where we lobbied for the institutionalization of this uh, Continental Dialogue to be an annual, to be on an annual basis. So this was passed at the AU annual meeting that was held this February, and we're looking to have our second Youth Peace and Security Continental Dialogue this year in Bujumburi. Again, that is open for young people across, not only across the continent, but globally to be able to contribute. Now, specifically in these discussions, we speak about the Continental Framework of Youth Peace and Security and have young people contribute within this Continental Framework, as well as share best practices and uh, practical solutions that have worked within their communities. And again, uh, you know, um, contributing at national level as well as community level so that it just does not end at, um, you know, having these dialogues on continental level. It does not just end with our youth peace ambassadors at regional level, but it can go back to national level as well as have contributions coming in uh, at global level to contribute towards what's already being done on the ground. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chido, for your input there. Um, unfortunately, I think that's all the questions we have time for. I apologise that we didn't get to go through all of them today. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of our panellists today and to all of our Common Futures Conversation community members who presented their ideas. Um, they're really insightful. Um, policy solutions. Uh, thank you to the rest of the audience uh, for all our com common, co common conversations uh, members and Chatham House members and everyone else in attendance. Uh, if you're at all interested in joining our Common Futures Conversations community, applications to join will be opening in early August and our CFC team will post a link to the web page in the chat. You can follow us at, at Common Futures CH on Twitter or at ch underscore common futures on Instagram for more information. Thank you very much to everyone for coming today.